Mr. Norm McDonald. chips a lot you, know. you can tell sometimes just one big chip that's really insulting <laughs> so, yeah. there are casinos where you know what I like is casino you know because there's the Vegas then there's the casinos like this and then there's Indian casinos which I like the best because I feel like I'm doing some reparations you know <laughs> for methodically murdering their uh, <laughs> forefathers, which looking back was way out of line, way out of line. But uh, I've pretty well done my share of paying back, I'll tell you that. I got no guilt, I fucking paid my fuck, I paid some of you guys this fucking share. <laughs> So, uh... <laughs> I was in Vegas. It's funny, I'm in Vegas, and now I'm here in uh, Hollywood. <laughs> oh, who anybody thinks they're fooling about it? <laughs> Fuck me in that. <laughs> I was down to two choices. Phil is going with Columbus. Bob's going with Hollywood. <laughs> now, now, this is this. <laughs> Plus, I live in LA. Hollywood is a piece of shit. Like, <laughs> I didn't realize until I moved to Hollywood. It's like a fake place. Like, you know, because you. I thought Beverly Hillbillies and shit. I thought everything was like that. But if you ever been to Hollywood, it's fucking horrible. Like, there's the stars on the ground, but you don't know any of them. They're from radio and shit. <laughs> and then people are pissing on them. Like, that's not a way to, you know, uh, make Bob Hope's family feel good or anything. <laughs> When you go to a casino, because when I was in Vegas, now here, people will sometimes come and they'll have a system. You know what I mean? They'll have a system. They're going to break the bank. You know what I mean? They're going to beat the casinos. And sometimes these systems actually do not work. <laughs> and this is what I saw. It was a couple of months ago, but let's pretend it's today. <laughs> I was on the elevator today. <laughs> no, it was a couple months ago. And, and a month later, I figured out a joke. <laughs> Anyways, I got on the elevator, and this is what I heard. It was just, uh, all there was was a man and his wife on the elevator, and I got on, so it was just us three. And tension. There was a lot of tension. So it was just us four. And... <laughs> We we're going down, and it was getting more and more tense, and suddenly the guy out of the blue, he goes, he says to his wife, he goes, I don't give a fuck what I said, give me the money, like that. So I think, I think I was witnessing like the unraveling of a system of some sort, like that this fellow was calling an audible, you see. Vegas has a very weird, odd slogan. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like uh, you know how it says that slogan? You're like, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, you like peaches? I don't know what they are, but I should. 
I should have done some research on this, but you know what I'm talking about. Virginia, for people who like to lay down on ladies or whatever, you know. You've heard them. Columbus, or actually Hollywood, I don't know, anyway. But uh, Vegas has this one that's so shady. It says, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, you know? Which is like, good God, you know? You might as well just have a, a guy going like. <laughs> what kind of a shady, and also it's not true. It's not like you can just kill someone and leave. You know, they'll follow you. They'll hunt you down, bring you back. Try you and a jury of your peers <laughs> sniffling a lot tonight. And it makes me paranoid when I sniffle because I think you guys will think I'm on cocaine. And <laughs> I'm also, I am on a lot of cocaine. And so that makes me paranoid as well. So the combination of being on cocaine. I'm being worried you guys think I am on cocaine, even though I'm not. Hell of a cocktail, you know? <laughs> Anyways, my point is, this is this is Las Vegas. That, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So I, I thought about it. I started ruminating on it, trying to figure out what it meant. I started night after night, not being able to sleep, trying to figure out the slogan. And then I finally figured it out. All it really means is you can go to Las Vegas, have sex with a prostitute, and the prostitute will not tell your wife back home. <laughs> They're very discreet, that big time Las Vegas prostitutes. You know, they're not like the like gossipy small town whores. You know, the fucking those fucking blabbermouths <laughs> don't know when to keep their mouth shut, you know? In the beauty parlor. You're Alec Majerison's wife? Well, my God. Small world. I took a shit on <laughs> Last night, I took a shit on his chest. In exchange for cash, I... Small world. Where's your small world? Isn't that a weird thing, small world? I don't believe that the world's small. It seems very large to me. Like, like this seems large. And compared to the world, this is shit. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't mean to insult you or anything like that. But you're all shit. No, but you're much smaller than the world, that's all I'm saying. But you know, the way people use that term, let's say you go to Paris, France, you know, and you go, you're watching, you're looking at the Arch of Triumph. I should have started with a French word. It's not the Arch of Triumph, is it? The Arch de Triumph. And you're watching it, and uh, there's a fellow standing next to you, and you go, hey, uh, 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 I'm from uh, Columbus, Ohio. And the other guy goes, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, too. You go, small world. Small world, you know, and I don't. I think that happens very rarely, though. So I don't believe that it's a small world. <laughs> I think I think most of the conversations in front of the Arch de Triomphe go like this: go like, "Hey, I'm from Columbus, uh, Ohio. Where are you from? I'm from Paris, France." <laughs> you know? Well, it's a big fucking world. I'll tell you that. Damn, is a giant globe. <laughs> Hardly nobody knows anybody. <laughs> you know what's a, a thing I realized about gambling? Very rational. This is what I heard myself say. At a, uh, again, we can pretend it's today. <laughs> but I am at one that this happened uh, a while ago. I'm at a roulette table. I walked, this is how irrational you are when you're gambling. And, and I heard myself say this. I go to the, crab, uh, the roulette table, rather. I put $100 down on black. It spins around and it lands on red. 
And then I say, fuck, I almost picked that. <laughs> That's very rational. And the entire table understood. That was also... They were like, wow, well, yeah, you can't second guess yourself on that. You know. If you understand anything about the game of roulette... Took an airplane from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I got scared of those motherfuckers. Even though, you know, I probably get killed on an airplane. Yeah? But you know what I do? I get the um, uh, the row. The it's called the exit row. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, it should be called "Please God, not the exit row." <laughs> but it's called the exit row. And uh, it's good because you get a, 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 about a foot extra um, leg room. And all you have to do to get the extra uh, leg room, all you have to do to sit in the exit row is to lie. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is the stewardess comes up to you and she's, flight attendant. <laughs> she comes up to you. A lot of new words, all right, okay. <coughs> I come from a different time. <laughs> Usually people say that from the future, but I'm saying it from the past. <laughs> I come to you from a different time when stewardesses, uh, I come to you from a time when if you were a lady and you were a flight attendant, we would call you a stewardess. And if you're a gentleman and you're a flight attendant, we would call you, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> now, a steward, a steward. What were you guys thinking? I think I'm outraged now. I'm outraged by what you guys thought in your brains. I'm leaving in a huff. I got the new huff. Have you tried it? It's, it's, uh, it's the Chrysler huff. I'm going to be leaving in it. So. I can't be. You know what? You know, I don't know how anyone can be outraged by anything. Like, I could see it way back in the old days, but nowadays? Fuck. You think, like, how could I be uh, 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 outraged by watching some guy on stage saying something? You know, I've seen internet pornography. <laughs> Once you've seen this, Anthony Jeselnik is not going to make you... I mean, this shit, by the way, if you've never seen pornography on the internet, don't. <laughs> because it, it's going to change you. <laughs> Fundamentally, and you're never going to get be able to come back. It takes years and years. God, the first time you, I ever, I came on late to it, but probably the first time about six years ago. People have been watching along before that. And I thought in my stupid head that it was just a picture. Like, you know, sometimes a guy would show me a picture from the internet of it be like uh, a lady with a horse. But I just, but the picture was just put together, right? Like Photoshop. I thought that's what, stupidly, I thought that's what internet porn was. Anyways, six years ago, I see actual internet porn. And, for the, and at first, I'm astounded, uh, first of all, by the number of ladies. Like, I go, what? God's like, it's like one of 36 of 3 million, 400 billion. You're like, is every woman a poor or something? What happened? Like, and the things they're doing, I'm like, holy Lord, no lady has ever done anything to me anywhere close to this. And I was on the TV. 
I go, how can this be possibly happening? But then you change. What happens is you become desensitized. You ever heard of that word? Oh uh, yeah, they like to use it in big bucks, make you sleepy. <laughs> but what it means is, it's not enough for you. You need more, you need more, like any addiction, you know? Like after a few months of that internet porn, you're like, ah, she can only take eight cocks of her ass. <laughs> Why'd you get in the business and you have fucking prude? I'll find another thing. I'll find a worse thing a person can do to another person. I need it, I tell you. So you gotta get out of that shit. I don't know what the poor children are doing, you know what I mean? I mean when I was young, we had like a... Uh, Playboy, whatever. I remember my dad saying, when I was young, all I needed was to see like Lana Turner's uh, ankle walking down the stairs. <laughs> Which I also thought was weird. You're like, ah! Like <laughs> ankle, you know? I don't want to get, you know, but I saw a thing, you know, people should tell you what they're showing you on the internet before they show you, you know what I'm saying? They just go, here you go, ah, that's the worst thing ever, why did you show me that? So anyways, guy showed me a picture of a lady making sweet love to a, a, a pig. A pig, like a, an actual pig from a farm, you know, barnyard animal, a pig. You're all familiar with a pig, I don't have to put to find a point on it when I keep saying pig, do I? <laughs> so I felt so, guy didn't want to watch, I felt sorry for the lady, I felt sorry for the, I felt sorry for the pig, you know? And I know a lot of people wouldn't feel sorry for the pig, but you gotta figure, you know, you gotta think of the pig's life. Like, the pig's in a sty with a bunch of fucking other gross, ugly, fat pigs, and, and they have sex, and then one day they take them, and they were a beautiful lady, you know? And he, He's like, holy lord. I never knew it could be like this, you know, and then the next day they throw him back in the sty. He's like, ah! You're all a bunch of fat pigs. I didn't know before. And you take the pig from the farm and onto a, uh, a porno shoot, but you can't take the porno shoot from the pig and give it back to the farm. I think we all know that saying. <laughs> Do you know what my doctor told me, by the way, as on a related note? I am on the same, I am on the same dose of Viagra that they give to the donkeys in Mexico for the second show. <laughs> God, how much Viagra do I need? No, I don't have sex. I, I retired from that shit a long time ago. And uh, I didn't do that good. You know, looking back, because I was on the TV and shit, and I didn't get much from being a uh, celebrity. Like, you know, like that lady took her kid, got her into heart. I didn't, I didn't know you could do that. Like, my kid... Uh, he's, he's fucking like a retarded, you know, he's not that smart. <laughs> so I put him in a retarded school, and that's a fucking fortune. <laughs> All right, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so I don't think I use my celebrity or like grab a girl by the pussy. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so, now, as what Trump said, that you could do that, but that's not been my experience. <laughs> They'll often go, sir. <laughs> I've never, of course, I've never done that. And I wouldn't even know how to do it because if you think of the physiognomy, <laughs> word I was pretty sure I'd get through life without ever saying. If you look at that, 
you know that a woman's vagina, it's, it's inverted. You can't grab, you know what I mean? I don't know how you would just grab, like I know how you would grab a guy's beautiful cock and shiny red ball. <laughs> nothing of that. Nah, we listen, we got a little dirty and uh, I blame myself for it. This is a big, this is an important year. I'm not here to talk about cocks. I'm sorry, I just think about cocks. No. I'm here to talk about important stuff. Hey, there's an election, election, big election going on, and uh, this is always a tough time for me because I don't know a lot of stuff, and I don't have many opinions, you know? I come from a different time. <laughs> when I was young, we didn't have no opinions. Like, we had some, like, you know, six, I think. <laughs> Sometimes we see a guy have eight opinions, go, God damn, that fucker's opinionated. He's always seventh and eighth opinion. But yeah, we had about six opinions, and most of them were about food, to tell you the truth. A lot of it was like, Boo Berry, what are you, retarded? And also, they think that because you're a comedian, that you have an opinion that you're, for some time a while ago, I don't know when, they decided that comedians were smart. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to disillusion you, but uh, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not smart in any way. <laughs> <laughs> See, we used to know that, like in the old days, like 30 years ago, nobody would be going, hey, Red Skelton, what do you feel about Vietnam? It'd be retarded. <laughs> but then something happened, and oh, the, the, the comedian, you know, I never, I read one place, they said the comedian is the modern day philosopher. And the uh, first thing I thought is, I wonder how the actual modern day philosophers feel about it. <laughs> you know, that's toiling away in obscurity, you know. What do you got there, Phil? I got the... Who the fuck is Bill Maher, by the way? I keep talking about, keep talking about him. I, he hasn't come up with one single important, I wish I knew a full of philosophy term. <laughs> I know it's not pronounced philosophy in your country. <laughs> when I say I don't know anything, by the way, I, or I don't have opinions, I do, but, uh, you know, there are ones that everybody has, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know yellow is the best color, like stuff like that, where everybody <laughs> agrees, you know what I mean? But when it comes to these very hard questions, you know, and they're like, they'll, and I don't know. And you know what? I don't feel so bad because sometimes I'll watch a news program and they'll ask a question. It'll be a hard one, you know? They'll say like, do you believe that the NAFTA will, uh, will hurt uh, the gross national product of uh, Malaysia? Or <laughs> yes or no. And then they say at the end, we'll be showing you the results. And then sure, uh, to their word, at the end of the news program, they show you the results of the poll in a pie chart. And you start thinking about pie. <laughs> God damn, I wish this question was about fucking pie. <laughs> but anyways, um, and it's always like 45% yes, 45% no, and then it's 10%, one slice of the pie, you know, not very big, but big enough, I don't know. And so then when I heard about, you know, then I go, well, that's a lot of people, 10%, you know, 10% of, uh, you know, this uh, greatest possible country in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, I'll take that, you know, that's 30, 40 million people. I won't be ashamed to be one of them. I don't know. <laughs> and I will answer those, if I, anytime I see a, a, one of those polls on CNN or one of those shows, I'm a sucker for it, man. I'll always phone them up. I go, yes, I have, uh, I want to, is this the TV? <laughs> yes. Uh, 
I want to answer because you had a question. Yes. I don't, I don't know the answer. No, that's my answer. I don't know. I better show up on that fucking pie chart. I'm no sap. You're not dealing with a sap. All right, I'll keep my voice down. Huh? People are trying to figure out how Trump won, you know, last time. Because, uh, you know, they're wondering how they can beat him this time. And uh, everybody has theories, they've written books on and everything. I have my own theory, but I'm a simple man, you know, with simple thoughts, you know? So maybe this is a little simple. But I've never heard anybody else say this, and it seems kind of obvious to me. I think the reason that Trump won the presidency of the United States is because he was the only guy running. <laughs> I know a lady was running also. <laughs> Pick the perfect time for that little fucking experiment. <laughs> Couldn't have worked out better. <laughs> Couldn't have waited a little time to be stylish. I had to go right. <laughs> and big Hillary Clinton. As a matter of fact, she even wrote a book, you know? And, uh, you know, you know how they say you can't uh, judge a book by its cover? I disagree. <laughs> I believe you can read a book by its cover. I've read many, many books. <laughs> and, uh, I'll, for instance, that book you can read by its cover. I'll tell you the cover. It's only five words. It's all you need to know. It says, uh, what happened? Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> So, she was more self-aware than any of us ever knew. But I really believe that. I think the American people, and I can see it from outside because I'm from Canada, I think the American people said, listen, Hillary, here's the deal. We hate your guts. God damn, we hate you. I'll tell you how much we hate you. This is gonna blow your mind, Hillary. <laughs> we hate you so much that we are gonna vote for a guy we hate more than you. What do you think of that? <laughs> Just to rub it in. They have ads now, you know. They'll show you ads. But they're for people, you know, because if you're already deciding who you want to vote for now, you're you're very acute. Uh, I don't know if that's the word, but you know, <laughs> pretend it is. You're very, you know, politically acute. That actually might be the right word. So, uh, you know, so they're trying to go at you. You're, you're smart, so you'll see the commercials now. I've seen them. They're smart. You know, so, like a guy will come on TV, or a lady. <laughs> and the guy will say, listen, if you want to hear my proposals about the, the reform of the prison system that's necessary, if you want to hear my ideas about uh, uh, children coming out of college a half a million in debt and how we fix that, if you want to hear my opinions on how we fix a broken medical care system, then go on my website and you can read my position paper on it. It's 45 pages. And then I go, oh no. I won't be reading that. <laughs> Nothing against you there, partner. You uh, seem like a nice enough gent. But uh, here's the thing. The reason, I'm going to tell you the reason I won't be reading your 45 page thing. It's on account of earlier today, my friend was telling me that uh, I only get the one life. I still have a half a box of Matlock DVDs. I can't do everything, you know.
The funny thing is that when they when they get down to it, you know, what I heard this. I heard this uh, uh, psycho, you know, psychology, psychology. Yeah. I heard of it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm retarded. I know you've heard of it. <laughs> you guys ever heard of the word psychology? <laughs> so I read this thing that they said that when it comes to picking presidents, you know how in psychology you have two brains. You have your brain up here. And then you have another brain back here, the subconsciousness. You have your consciousness, sub... So the consciousness, that's what you use to buy Count Chocula, you know? <laughs> the easy stuff. The subconsciousness, that fucking shit, you don't even know what you're thinking. It doesn't tell your conscious brain, it's... Uh, anyway, whatever. But what they said was that when people pick the President of the United States, what they what they go by is they pick the guy that they would rather have a beer with. Isn't that odd? And what's even odder is that no politician that I've ever known has ever used that, you know, very potent weapon. <laughs> like if it was me, that would be the spine of my campaign. Like, like I, everywhere I go, I'd have a, a glass of beer in my hand, you know? And then, like, my slogan would be like, uh, ah! <laughs> I do commercials, I go, ah! You like beer? You should come to the White House and drink some with me. The guy goes, God damn, something I like about that guy. <laughs> I don't drink myself, you know, uh, personally. Uh, does that make me better than you? I don't know what makes me better than you. That's probably one of the things. <laughs> no, here, listen to this. I don't do drugs and I don't drink. But is that really true? Is that really true? Because check this, dig this, cats. I smoke cigarettes, right? So you go, so what? That's not a drug, really? Because nicotine's a drug. You're like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> or this, a Red Bull. I drink Red Bull. Got caffeine in it. You go, yeah, so what? Caffeine's not a drug, really? Because it, it is a drug. <laughs> See? <laughs> So maybe I'm not better than most of you. I do LSD. You guys aren't, you're like, that's not a drug. I'm like, really? That's not a drug? Really? Because it bends your mind. I mean, I'm starting to think you guys are retarded when it comes to drugs. But before every show to relax, I take 10 or 20 uh, hits of LSD. Just a, just a handful, and I swallow them down. Helps me relax. They had me go to a psychiatrist for it, but god damn, what a broken record this fucker was. The whole half hour, he's like, you gotta stop taking fistfuls of LSD before every show. I'm like, oh, yeah. Is that all you fucking say? <laughs> And I love how this guy is the expert on hallucinogenic drugs. You know, when I'm the guy that's taking a fistful of LSD. But this guy, I'm supposed to... Oh, man, you wouldn't believe this character, man. First of all, he's a 14-foot blue dog with a big green tongue and shit. Doesn't even look like a regular psychiatrist. He knows it all. Ooh, he's an expert. On account of he studied all those melting books that are uh, behind them. Don't get me started. Hey, what about that one? Don't get me started. It might be too late for me to have a catchphrase at this point, my <laughs> Hey, there's that guy that always says, 
don't get me started just for the last little while. <laughs> no, but don't get me started. I come from another place, another time, another place as well. I wrote some shit down on a piece of paper and then I glued it or I taped it to this chair, but I don't understand hardly any of it. <laughs> I have very bad handwriting. And one thing I put, here's the thing, here's what happened, this is a thing about getting old. I wrote down, this, I'm reading this as, I, big fluffy dog. That's what I wrote down, right? So I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> But I remember it happening. I remember thinking up a joke. I remember, because I took my dog to a dog bar, there was a big fluffy dog, right? And then they, my dog went to the big fluffy dog, and then he did something that, I can't remember, but it was super funny, and it was also, it was like the, so universal, like everybody's been through it. And then I write, you know, big fluffy dog. <laughs> When I remember when I was a kid, uh, when I started out doing stand-up, we'd get so stoned and drunk every night, and then we'd tell each other jokes after the show. Go, hey, what about this? When your luggage comes out, a fucking carousel. Ah. And go, God damn, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. Go, of course, it's funny. I would do that in my nightclub act. Yeah. And then the next day we'd wake up, fucking blackout drunks. So we remember a fucking thing. And so I had an idea. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this was way before, you know, teensy weensy tape recorders and all that shit that we have nowadays. I said, I'll get a little notebook. And if I think of anything funny, if I say anything funny, or if anybody does, I would have just stolen theirs. You know? <laughs> I will write it down in my little book and then the next day I'll have it and you know. And so uh, we have already after the show, we're like, ah, what about a cat acts more like he's your owner than a dog. Ah. And I was, God damn, that's funny and shit. And the next day, I black out again. I couldn't remember a fucking thing, but I remember I had that book, you know. So I ran over the book, no word of a lie, opened the book, all it says in it is, that's really funny. In big, <laughs> like giant letters. <laughs> I took the airplane, I was afraid, you know. I get afraid in the airplane, I'll tell you that. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. What's that thing where they go, if the thing comes down, I don't like that one. If the oxygen mask comes down, make sure to put it on your face before your little child. And I go, well, that was my plan, you fucker. You didn't have to blab it to everybody. <laughs> I, I love my little child and everything, but he's never been on a TV, right? You know? <laughs> I don't want to just lie to you. Say, oh, by the way, if the jet crashes at 900 miles an hour into the ocean, don't worry about it or nothing. On account of your uh, seat cushion <laughs> is a boat. <laughs> and I go, oh, great, it's a boat. That's... <laughs> Why did I ever buy a fucking boat? Now that I think about it, I could have got a fleet of seat cushions. <laughs> Dumb purchase, buying that boat. <laughs> the only time you do survive in an airplane crash, and this time, this is one of the reasons I believe in God. If you crash into the Andes, why can't they let you die then, you know? <laughs> that's when you survive. And that's because I think God, you know, he, he, he likes a good laugh as much as an accident. <laughs> So he's like, I'm not going to kill these people. I'll let them live for a while. And then after 40 or 50 days, they'll have to grapple with an ethical dilemma, you know. <laughs> cannibalism. I'm talking about cannibalism. And listen, I'm against cannibalism. If you know anything about me, you know. The tireless work I've done on anti-cannibalism. I've done too much work. Fuck them, I'm not gonna do it anymore. Man can only do so much. But, and I'm not gonna preach to you, I'm not gonna use this some kind of bully pulpit, oh, cannibalism, because you guys are adults. 
your views on cannibalism are set and you know what I mean? You're not going to change your mind. <laughs> I like to get young people, you know? That's why I travel all across this great continent, you know? Well, except for Mexico. I'm not going to fucking Mexico. <laughs> but like America and Canada, you know? And, uh, and I talk to the kids, right? The kids in high school. The kids in, in elementary school, you know? And I try to tell them, I go, listen, kids, you might think it's cool that you, you ate your buddy in algebra class. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie to you, you will be the talk of the school for quite some time. But the future, the future, I go like this, you know, I don't want to. But the thing when they crash into the, the Andes, here's their big problem. They haven't thought it out, you see what I mean? So they're so maddened by hunger, right? At the time that, because uh, uh, they've waited 30, 40, 50 days to decide whether to eat the co-pilot or whoever. And so now they're, they're just so hungry, they just tear into the, ah! You know, they got fucking co-pilot all over their shirt. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> that's not a healthy way to eat. That's the only point I'm trying to make. I've been studying nutrition lately. I was thinking of becoming a nutritionist part-time. And uh, one thing they said, almost all nutritionists agree on this. <laughs> Don't gorge. I can leave you with anything. They talk about grazing. Instead of the three meals we've been taught, you know, where I, where I came from, <laughs> has been changed now. You're supposed to have like eight meals, it's called grazing. So in other words, in the morning, you, allow, you would have a small portion of co-pilot, <laughs> you know? And then mid-afternoon, a, a, a small portion of co-pilot, you know? Now all this is because you didn't think it through, you know? And I'm here to tell you, because I'm an old man and you're a young man, mostly. But I can tell you, as young men, that a lot of eventuality is gonna be thrown at you in this here life, and you better be ready for them. You better have a plan, you know? I got a plan for everything, you know? I mean, we were, uh, I have a plan for cannibalism. We were, we were, uh, we were flying here from Vegas uh, uh, to come here, and there was a little turbulence. And uh, immediately I was like, I'm eating the fucker in 14E. <laughs> Saw that guy on the way in, he looked delicious. <laughs> ah, maybe I'll just eat him anyway. <laughs> the, there's the thing. If you crash, right, in an airplane on pavement, there's nothing left. Like, they will show. If they have a big airplane crash, they just go there with cameras, and you never see a body or a guy like this over, you know, or a guy. You never see anything because they've all been vaporized. Just turned into, I don't know, stuff. <laughs> Ashes to ashes, stuff to stuff, as the <laughs> scriptures say. And then the relatives, they want the stuff. They don't call it stuff. They call it remains. We'd like the remains, you know, because they want some closure, you know what I mean? And I can understand that. You know, they're at home, they're like, ah, I can't go to sleep, you know. Every night I just worry about Philip's last moments and that downward spiral. Uh, uh, if only I could see his remains. <laughs> and then I'd get a good sleep. <laughs> Put this whole thing behind me. I don't understand, but who knows what grief. God damn, I wish I had a word. Oftentimes I'll start a sentence hoping a word will show up. So I said, who knows what grief 
Where did you show it? <laughs> so I think there's a lesson for all of us in that. <laughs> no, there's no lesson in anything. Hey! I'm, I'm not a wise person. But I'll tell you this, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot wiser than people were in the old days. This is what, in the old days, if you wanted to read something wise, right, you had to read a whole big, long motherfucking book was, like, be all sleepy, you think of nine days, to, and then there'd be one sentence and he'd go, God damn, that's wise. I remember that sentence, right? Nowadays, all you have to do is go to a cup store. <laughs> Every cup you look at says the wisest fucking thing you ever heard. You know, God damn, I'm gonna buy that cup and just read it every day. No, fuck that cup. That cup's the wiser each day. God, does any of this make any sense to anybody? <laughs> I will say this, I'm getting older, you know what I mean? Um, I suppose we could all say that in a way. <laughs> but uh, I'm, at, at the certain, I'm at an age where uh, like three or four times a day I will check the status of my left arm. Have you ever done that? <laughs> well, you, you know, this is all I know about medicine. I go to doctors, I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm a hypochondriac, I, I don't know, I think I'm just, I know like first detection is important, so I always want to go to the doctor, you know? And sometimes you do one thing and it sticks with you, and I know, uh, I know what I did one time, and they started talking, uh, the doctors talk to each other, whatever. But they think I'm a hypochondriac, because one time I had a pap smear. <laughs> whatever. They smeared my pad, everything was fine. <laughs> Turns out I'll never get cervical cancer. <laughs> but anyways, I like going to specialists, you know what I mean? Like, let's say my foot hurts. I go, hey, I'd like to go to a foot doctor, but you can't do that. You can't just go to a foot doctor. You have to go to a regular doctor, and then the regular doctor goes, God damn, you gotta go to a foot doctor. <laughs> So I give you the name, just pay Agnes $80 on the way out, you're like, okay. You go, you want me to take your blood pressure in? You're like, that's all right. I've retired from getting my goddamn blood pressure taken. Yeah, I think I've had my blood pressure taken about probably six, 7,000 times. What good is a doctor if he can fucking do the same thing that uh, CVS can do. <laughs> yeah, fucking doctors, huh? So you go, no, no, I don't want your goddamn. He goes, all right, can I interest you in hitting your knee with a hammer? <laughs> Here's one. Do you believe we still allow this to fucking happen? Like, what are, we must be retarded, seriously. This is like from the cartoons back in the 50s. A doctor says to us, can, can I hit your knee with a hammer? We go, oh yeah, sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> so then he takes a hammer, or hits your knee, and they're like, ah, my knee! And then he writes down, he's like, excellent. <laughs> it's exactly how you should react when you're struck by a hammer in your knee. Your leg is not paralyzed. I'm gonna put an X beside, is your leg paralyzed? Okay, you just pay Agnes on uh, the way out. <laughs> Sometimes they'll use smart words. You ever have that? Because they're doctors and you're not. And so they know all the smart words. One time I remember I went to a doctor and said, God damn, doctor, I don't know what I got. I'm tired all the time. He goes, sound like chronic fatigue syndrome. I said, what's that? He says, well, chronic means always. Fatigue means tired. And a syndrome is uh, something you got. <laughs> so anyways. Pay Agnes on the way out. <laughs> Agnes is beyond a lot of this fucking horse shit in my mind. I trust her as far as I can throw her. I realize doctors can't give you good uh, news. 
when you think about it. Think about this for a second, right? A doctor will never come back, go, well, Mrs. Jorgensen, made it, made it a lady. Because <laughs> ladies and men, right? Hey, listen, Mrs. Jorgensen, we checked your blood uh, panel, and uh, good news, you're immortal. You don't have to come back no more. No. No. They can only give you a reprieve of bad news yet to come. You know, they go, we've looked at your blood panel. Everything is perfect, tip top. You're in perfect shape. So uh, just go on with your life. Come back every year. And then one day. <laughs> it's not going to be good. <laughs> If I ask, uh, for instance, if I say to you, uh, Catherine, if I say, maybe your husband should come in, that's a clue. <laughs> but anyways, expect to cry, expect to have your mind shattered like a crystal vase. You may even plead with me to give your life. You know, I've had that, believe me, people are funny. <laughs> I have my, uh, this is how old I'm getting, and I don't mean to be morbid, but I, I you got to get things in order, right? And uh, I know I'm getting old. I have a white beard. I paint my head black or whatever color. The guy paints it for me. <laughs> but I keep my white beard so that when I look in the mirror, I know, you know what I mean? Because I feel that God gives us white hair as a, a warning. It's just, you know, it's his way of saying, hey, you know, get your affairs together because <laughs> so anyways I had a white beard I go I gotta go make out a will so I made out a will I got everything planned my funeral is gonna be you know how funerals are like uh, all sad and everything like that instead of you know instead of having a party they're all sad so that's what I'm gonna do I have a real sad one nobody have any fucking fun and and everybody can only talk about me. I wrote it all down. <laughs> you know what? If I could lead a life where after my death, like at my funeral, somebody could no longer go on, I think I would have accomplished something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if somebody just leaped out the window <laughs> at the No, I have, uh, I have very exact uh, uh, things that I want done at my funeral, you know. I, this is what one thing. I'm going to have the people come and look at my body. I understand people like fucking looking at dead people. <laughs> so they can all come and gander at my corpse. But then at the end, I just want my closest friends to just circle, uh, talk about the good times, and reminisce, and... Uh, try to bring me back to life. <laughs> That's all. Because every funeral I've been at, I go, that motherfucker might be, I don't know. <laughs> Shouldn't we shake him or something? <laughs> they don't let you shake him. <laughs> Most of my stuff is about shaking. I go, shake the fuck out of me. Don't worry about my, just shake me a lot and do this. Hit my chest like this here. I tried a little picture, you know. <laughs> Guys say, you got to get an epitaph, you know, for your gravestone. They say, you got to make it funny, you know, you're a comedian. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Because here's the problem. You make your little funny joke, and then they come and they visit you, you know. And then the next time they come and visit you, and they go, yeah, there's that joke. And then the third time they go, fucking same fucking joke. <laughs> If I have to, God, then read that motherfucking joke one more time. I'm never going to visit Norm's grave site again. He'll just be in the dustbin of history. So instead, what I ha I'm going to have is a big neon sign, which will just go for eternity, you know, as long as my estate can afford it. 
none of it will go to my children or anything. It'll all go to this neon sign. And the neon sign will flash forever. It will, it will flash, be sad now. Be sad now. Because people have to know, you know? I even got a living will. Now this, a living will is a different thing. This is for if you're ever in a situation where you, you're in a coma and you can't make a decision for yourself, then you have it pre-written, you know? So you, your wishes are on, uh, are on record. And uh, it's mostly to do with a, a plug. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to bring anybody down or nothing like that, but uh, uh, I don't know how to say this. But you know, just statistically, like there's 500 people, about three of you uh, will end up getting plugged into the wall at some point. <laughs> Sorry to be the one to say this. And I'm not going to point you out, you know, because I don't think that's fair. <laughs> you ever do that with a big group of people, though, when you're with, when you look at a big group of people, and go, hey, I wonder who fucks kids here. <laughs> If the guy beside you had shifty eyes just now, you know, report him. I always look for shifty eyes. But anyways, my, uh, my living will is pretty simple. It's just, basically, it says, uh, keep your grubby hands off the plug. You know, just, the plug stays in the wall. My mother said, oh, you don't want to be a burden. I'm like, oh, sorry, oh my God. I would hate to, to break up your uh, once a month bridge game so you could go to the hospital and touch the back of my hand. And let me know that I am. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm a little fucking uh, burden myself here with the plug. Because if you don't put, if you don't make a living will, I'm telling you, make a living will, because if you don't, right, then your family gets to decide. And I wonder what they'll decide. <laughs> Maybe the thing they decide every single time. They don't decide right away, you know, at first, because, you know, you got somebody in a coma, you know, kind of cool in a way. You know, it's, it's sad, but at the same time, you know, you bring your friends and you go, check this out. She used to cook cherry pies and shit. <laughs> yeah, that gray thing there. Had uh, hopes and dreams and shit. You, I'm not kidding you. But like anything else, the novelty wears off. And then, then they start getting a little peeve that they have to keep making these hospital visits, you know. And then that's when my brother would go, hey, Doc, I remember you asking me if Norm ever said anything about this. And uh, last night I was thinking about it, by God, I don't know if this counts, but one time we were having dinner, and uh, he says to me, he says, uh, or I said to him, I said, what would happen if uh, you had to be plugged into the wall? And uh, he said to me uh, that we should uh, kill him. <laughs> And then we get to go back and live our lives again, right? <laughs> yep, that's what he said. <laughs> you have to use your common sense. Like, what would a person say? Let's say a person's in a coma. You wake them up. They're, wake, they're awoken for one minute. And you go, hey, listen, friend, we only got a minute. Uh, here's the, uh, the choice I want you to make. Sounds kind of ridiculous now that I'm saying it out loud, but uh, would you rather lie here on the bed with the TV or uh, uh, bear, bury you in, underneath the earth? I said, that's a question? The first one, the first one. I 
my in my living will, it's not even one plug. It's a series of <laughs> intertwining plugs with surge protectors and a Byzantine sort of. Because I don't want one of those janitors with a wide broom. Yeah, those guys who are going to hit my plug. My brother slipping on a five in the hallway. I know. I know the wicked ways of men. But seriously, I feel we have gotten a little morbid. I don't like it. Don't like it one bit. Let's think of something life affirming. Huh? <laughs> what? Babies. babies! Yeah, nothing better than babies. What a rich comedic territory that is. <laughs> Never thought of a single funny thing about a baby. Now, they're wonderful. I know that's not the funniest take you're ever going to hear on babies, but... But are they really? <laughs> but are they really? <laughs> yeah, they are, really. I mean, not baby tarantulas. I mean, not baby alligators. I mean, not baby crocodiles. Can't they call those the same fucking thing? <laughs> It's like an alligator has a fucking front snout. I don't give a fuck. I'm just gonna call it whatever I feel like. It's not a thing. I watch a lot of fucking uh, uh, nature shows. They were talking about the ostrich, and I thought, what a weird fucking animal. Because when God was making all the fowl of the of the firmament, you know. Um, he's like, all right, go ahead. Next, who's next? Okay, we're doing all the foul. Okay, okay, hey, ostrich, are you ready? And then the ostrich is like, hey, before I go, listen, man, I've been trying out my wings and shit. And I'll run real fast, go like this, and then I don't get no lift off. Something wrong. Something. And God's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, why well, thought it'd be cool to make a bird that can't fly? <laughs> yeah, I should go, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, how come I got wings then? <laughs> that makes you a bird, you fucking retard. <laughs> Look. And then I was like, listen, I don't mean no disrespect or nothing, but what happens when I'm running and shit, and then the wolf is chasing me, and I go, I try to fly, and the wolf uh, eats me. And then God's like, huh? I don't know, Astros. Damn it. All you do is ask questions. <laughs> hey, how about this? How about this? The ostrich is chasing you, right? What you do is you stop, you put your head in the sand. You can't see the ostrich. How can the ostrich see you? I mean, the well, fuck it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Sorry, let me, just let me start that. <laughs> well, it's great to be here in Hollywood. <laughs> you like there's one uh, song uh, by uh, uh, Elton John he goes uh, 
Um, if I were a sculptor, but then again, no. Or a traveling minstrel and a something show. And I thought, you can't do that. In a song. You can't go, if I were a sculptor, but then again, no. You have to just, can't you don't write the line. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And then there's this other one. It's Rod Stewart. The first cut is the deepest. He goes, the first cut is the deepest. He goes, I'll try to love again, but I know the first cut is the deepest, right? But if the first cut is the deepest, then this one won't be so bad. <laughs> it really should be, you know, I'll try to love again, but I know the second cut is the deepest. You know what I mean? <laughs> then I'd be scared. The second one's coming up. Instead, or he could go, hey, I'll love you, sure. You know why? Because the first cut's the deepest. I fucking got nothing to worry about now. I don't know, whatever. I know it's retarded. I should, and also, I gotta stop saying retarded, and I apologize. I, uh, here's a funny thing, you know, one time I, I did uh, my stupid stand-up, and a, a lady did a review of the show. And she said, Norm uses the word retard a lot in his act, which shows how incredibly stupid he is. And then I thought, hey, wait a minute. She said, stupid. Are you allowed to say that? Yeah. I mean, stupid people, it's not their fault. <laughs> And context, we all know, is, the most, is, is everything, you know? And here was, I'm going to tell you the exact context of my, what I was talking about. When I was talking about retards, I wasn't talking, I was talking about people with Down syndrome. You know? and, so here was the context. And you tell me if this context doesn't in any way ameliorate the meaning. This is what I said about retards. I love retards. That was what I said. And I do. I, I, you know, my best friend when I was a kid was a retard. And uh, my parents forced it, but it turned out it was fun. It was cool. And then uh, I remember like five years ago, there was, I lived in an apartment, four apartments down, there was this 19 year old kid who was a retard, and I, was, I wanted to be his friend, but his parents would have none of it, for obvious reasons. <laughs> a cynical world we live in, right? Like I wanna fuck. Uh, uh. But anyways, what I wanted from him, and what I, see, I don't pity retards. And I use the word retard because I don't want to say Down syndrome because then people think I'm a doctor and then they're going to want me to hit their knee with a hammer, you know how it goes. So I say retarded because I understand it's retarded at a certain point, not an insult, they're, they've been arrested in their development, they're retarded. Yeah. So, but they're happy and uh, that's what we all want. So what other people pity, I envy. If there was like a, like a, like a something some retard juice that you could put into your arm. So I would be at the front of the line to get the, you know, because happiness. How often are you happy? I'm happy a little bit, like when I wake up, I'm happy. I think because it's the first thing in the morning, I wake up, I'm like, ah, ah, I'm glad I bought that Tempur-Pedic pillow. That was the best thing I ever bought. But then, you know, the light comes in and then my memory of my life, my life's all around. I'm like, ah, what, the, what am I again? And then I go in the bathroom and I look at, that's the worst moment of me in the morning. Look in the, and I'm not talking about physically, like your looks, but you look right into your own eyes. At least me, I look in and I go, ah. <laughs> what, how did I become, what the? And at that point, I would like my retarded friend to be standing there going like, I like bananas. <laughs> I go, yeah, I do too. I never looked at it that way. <laughs> They're yellow. Yeah, you fucking rice. They're yellow. What do you say, me? You get a yellow banana? What do you think of that? 
think we'll be happy. Oh, how you can pity happy people. One guy told me, not all retards are happy. So, but I don't know, I never see you. Like, who's, have you ever seen a cynical retard? You know what I mean? Like a, a guy like, yeah, they're yellow, fuck bananas. I'm gonna, what do I care? The ones I see very happy. And so I don't understand pitying them. Like, I see it all the time. People looking, ah, oh, look at them all over there laughing. Ah. Makes me want to shake my head sadly. The problem is they don't realize what a horror life really is, you know. That's a, you know, the worst part is there's no cure. You know, those people will probably die happy. And again, I have to shake my head sadly at the thought of such a thing. That's good Red Bull. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think of something happy. I know we've, we've dealt with babies, and crib death. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing. Think about the crib business. How strong the crib business is that it survived crib death. <laughs> you feel once, <laughs> once that became a thing, crib death, you know, mothers and fathers would go, you know, maybe let the kids sleep with us. <laughs> it's just that, that crib death that's, uh, that's the only thing that bothers me. like a deathbed, you know, I won't buy one of those for <laughs> some point you gotta just decide, you know, what's worth it and, you know, a deathbed, even a sick bed I don't like. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can understand any of this horse shit I wrote down. No, but that's religion, you know. I'm religious personally, you know, and uh, it's not good, you know. When I was a kid, I, I felt everyone was religious when I was a kid, and nowadays, you say you're religious, people will think you're a retard. <laughs> like Bill Murray told me, you know, he goes, oh my God, why are you so dumb? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm dumb compared to Bill Maher, obviously, who isn't? But. And I don't, you know, maybe I'm not strong enough to be an atheist. I don't know. Maybe I'm not smart enough. But I do know one thing. If I was an atheist, I'd never try to talk anybody else into it. That's what I think is wrong. Just plain wrong, you know what I mean? Like, why, why, what's the upside of that? You know, you go, excuse me, you over there. You, yes, with the glint of hope in your eye. <laughs> Come on over here. I want to tell you something. You're born, you get real sick, and you die, they put some dirt on you. <coughs> Wanna come over to my house and talk about it all day with my friends? That's all we do. We have a podcast. <laughs> I read the, the uh, Jesus Christ Now, it's, and I'm not one of these guys you know, anybody can get to heaven. You know what I mean? It has nothing to do. There's a million different ways of getting to heaven, you know? As long as you're a good person and you're kind and you try to do well with others and you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, <laughs> anyone can get in, you know? <laughs> I read that Jesus Christ is now considered a uh, historical figure almost 100%, which to me is, doesn't really matter, you know, if it's divinity, if it's, it's either he's divine or he's not. Like my friend, he said, you know, I, uh, I really like Jesus, you know, I really 
like, but I don't think he's a God or son of God or anything like that. I think he's just an ordinary guy, but you know, he had great things to say. I'm like, what kind of fucking church is that? <laughs> Jesus was just an ordinary guy? That's your fucking contention? <laughs> well, you're doing the sermon, you're like, once, uh, Mark 4, verses 14 to 16, Jesus stood in front of the masses, and in front of him, he had four loaves of bread and four glasses of wine. And the, the masses looked unto Jesus, and Jesus said unto the masses, Sorry, man, there's only enough here for me, so I... <laughs> Jesus was just an ordinary guy. One time, Jesus went to uh, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees at the temple, and they were having a party. And uh, the music was loud, and Jesus called Peter to come unto him. And he said, Peter, you shall be the rock. Unto you shall the church be founded. And Peter said unto Jesus, sorry, ma'am, what was that? I wasn't listening. <laughs> there was a girl. And Jesus said, no, it doesn't matter. It's not, no, no. It's cool. I mean, it's cool. And Jesus went into the corner and sulked all night and wouldn't talk to anybody, not even the chicks. Jesus was just an ordinary guy. This was interesting, I found. Jesus is considered a historical figure. I always figured that. But did you know this? Here's a kind of surprising one. Jesus H. Christ was also a, a, a real person. I mean, that one no, uh, buckled my knees. A real guy, also from Bethlehem. He lived only a couple of blocks from Jesus. That's why he used the H. Because he was always being confused, you know. Oh, let me touch the hem of your nose. You want the cabinet maker over there. God damn, man. I'm a day laborer. He's a, he works fine. Can you, if we could just touch your hem of your, stop with the hem of the garment, would you? I'm Jesus H. Christ. I should have just gone with a herald. <laughs> and a very sad ending at the end. Uh, there were all these lepers. <laughs> and they uh, they were all following Jesus H. Christ. And they were all like, can we touch the hem of, yes, I know, of my garment. Yes, no, you can't. You're a bunch of fucking lepers. And he runs away. But the lepers get him and tie, and then he gets leprosy. And, uh, and then and I think in his final moments, he curses uh, Jesus himself and uh, gets raped by the devil for all of time. It was one of the saddest endings of any of them. Isn't it funny how some, some, this is what I've always felt. And first of all, you know, when I, when I say I'm a Christian, I'm not trying to fucking say I'm better than you, you know. Christians, this is a, a, I think people don't understand. Christians don't think they're better than anybody. They think they're the worst. Like they can't, you know, they're all worthless. They need, you know, Jesus or they're, they're no good. They're sinners. And it's true. You can't stop sinning for some reason, you know. Like, take me, I try my best. I swear to God, I try to be a good Christian. I eat an apples. <laughs> now, it's on page one of the book. <laughs> Worst thing you do, eat an apple. <laughs> but here's the thing. Some, I feel, the religious stuff will be over soon. <laughs> I feel that some of the commandments are easy to follow. Some are very difficult. Like, thou shalt not kill. Well, good Lord, if you can't follow that. You know what I mean? You should be able to follow that. But then other ones, like, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's oxen. Okay? Now, first of all, I feel this is unfair because many people... Their neighbors don't have an ox. 
so it's easy for them. <laughs> but what about me? I got an ox. Scraggly old fucking ox. This thing, I got it from a Mexican. It doesn't matter what, where he came from, but, but I should have bought it new is what I'm saying. And I get it home, it's all scraggly. I felt a little kind of sorry for him, his wife, whatever, but I get him home. He's all scraggly and he's like, walks weird and he's got a big hump and shit. And I, so I phone the next guy, I go, hey, what the fuck's up with the ox? He goes, oh yeah, he's got bursitis. <laughs> he's like, as long as he doesn't have to pull things. I'm like, oh, come on, what? Anyways, I got my goddamn fucking ox. No, he's nice, but I got him in my garage, right? Now, then my neighbor next door, I go by his house, and uh, his uh, uh, garage door is wide open. Big coincidence. And what stands there but the most beautiful, like lustrous, kind of chestnut Belgian ox. I've ever seen in my life, you know. And he's like, what do you think? Would you like to pet my, ah, I don't, I got my own ox. <laughs> but I'm coveting like a motherfucker. <laughs> I don't know how you uh, can pass that, yeah. You know what I can't get over is the psychology thing, you know, because it makes me feel like I can't understand myself, because now they say all kinds of things, you know, they say you can have repressed memories, you know about this, like how you recover a memory, like 30, 40 years pass, and you suddenly remember something, you know, that's never good. You know, it's never like, God damn, I used to like peaches. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, eat more peaches. It's always the most violent sexual hell that you went through that was so uh, impossible to digest by your consciousness that your self-consciousness came through and so But here's what I don't like about it. I used to, like I'd be at a party and somebody would come out and be like, hey Norm, your uncle ever fuck your ass? <laughs> And I would say, with pride, no! <laughs> but I can't say that anymore, see? <laughs> because there's actually two possibilities. My uncle never fucked my ass, or my uncle fucked my ass all the time, and I forgot. <laughs> So really, the only honest answer to that is I go, I don't know, 50-50? <laughs> My advanced math degree coming through, but I most need it. I just don't know. I don't, I don't feel, personally, I don't even know if I believe in recovered memories. I don't, if I do have one, God damn, please let me never recover it. <laughs> it's hard enough to go through life, uh, you know, but when you have to go through life, <laughs> you know those guys, God damn. <laughs> so I don't want to be going down a cheese store with my friend, go, hey man, what are we getting? Uh, the kind of cheese sandwich you getting today? Same cheddar, yeah, me too. <laughs> what do you think you'll get, one or, or two? I don't know, it's probably one. What about you, Norm? Me? <laughs> What's the matter, man? Huh? Nah, just to recall something. <laughs> From the ages of nine to 13, <laughs> my uncle fucked my ass every day. <laughs> All right, I don't want a cheese sandwich anymore. <laughs> I gotta go live my life, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> and then you're like that for the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> but I don't know, who knows what is and what isn't. 
Well, the show ended a long time ago. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell you, but but we're all hot. We want to get to, we want to get to that table. We want to get to those tables. I'll I'll, I'll end by saying one thing. It's, it's just. The uh, psychology thing, as we talk about psychology. My buddy, everything's psychology. This guy, everything has a different meaning. You know what I mean? So I remember one time I was eating uh, dinner with a guy. I love milk, you know? So I had a nice glass of milk. I was just about to eat it. I drink the milk, I mean. I was just about to drink the milk. And my friend says, he goes, you know why you're drinking that milk, right? And I go, I know it's not because I like milk a lot. <laughs> I know this guy. And he goes, nah, it's not that at all. He goes, what it is is you uh, miss sucking on your mother's breast. <laughs> so now I can't, what am I gonna guzzle the milk down at this point? <laughs> the milk's finished now for the meal. And my mother, I mean, you guys don't know my mother, but my Lord, you know, an 85 year old woman. And I love her. No, I couldn't love anybody more than my mother. You know, she lives right beside me. I have an apartment. She lives in the next apartment. But, pardon me? Go see her. Go see her? Is that what she said? Yeah, I'll go see my mother. She lives next door to me. <laughs> Sorry for being such a deadbeat son. <laughs> But I was thinking about this the other day. My mother is the type of person, you know, Me Too has started, and Me Too to me is a great revolution. I've never lived through any sort of revolution like this, a social revolution where women who have basically been slaves since the dawn of time are now taking their rightful place, and so our children, our grandchildren that are girls will be able to live a full life. So this is a beautiful thing. Every revolution has casualties. And what, and I was thinking about this the other day, one might be a, a woman like my mother, and you probably know uh, people like this. Uh, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's your grandmother, depending on your age. But my mother's the type of person, like, she would, uh, we would eat, you know, and she would always be just in the kitchen. And everybody got, you have the gravy, uh, Bill, do you need more? Oh, the turnips! <laughs> And okay, you don't forget dessert, leave enough for dessert. And I go, Ma, you got enough to eat up there? Oh yeah, but she would just be eating like what, what was left, you know? And then we'd finish, and she'd go, you boys will watch the TV, do you need to help watch? No, 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 I take care of it, so. And you know, um, I, th I don't think women are gonna be like that. Uh, and, and my mother, her eyes shine with love, you know what I mean? Like, I wish I could love with it intensity that she does with so effortlessly like she um, she and when she speaks there's never a, a, a moment of irony that comes from her and she like she goes she went to the store the other day and uh, she came back she said Norm the funniest story happened at the store I said what was it she goes there was a woman she bought a, a pineapple it was $1.69 but last week it was $1.19 I said that's not funny it's not, I don't even know if it's a story for that <laughs> But I, you know, I would uh, trade trade my life with hers because she has this uh, incredible sassy that I don't have. Uh, but anyways, whatever. I don't even know why I'm telling you all this. But oh, I remember. I don't want to suck her tits. That's what it is. Maybe, maybe that makes me shallow. I don't know. Hey, you guys win out there tonight, okay?